For years, Rewind has been successfully backing up thousands of small businesses' data that is stored in cloud apps like Shopify, BigCommerce, and Trello, saving these small businesses from CSV import errors, employee mistakes, and app integrations that didn't go as planned. Rewind has also been backing up QuickBooks Online company data too. That's right, Cloud Accounting World, I did say back up QuickBooks Online company data. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Rewind, later in the episode. Here's the ICP over here. They won't take a stand on IRS funding, but over here, they'll lead policymaking for a bunch of industries. You know what's interesting about this to me is that we're really focused, I guess ASCP is really focused on protecting the license, which like I get, right? That's one of it should be one of its core objectives is to protect the CPA because we all spend all this time to go get it. <laughs> but but then at the same time, you don't really need a CPA to do that much anymore. I mean, other than audit. Today is Sunday, April 18th. This is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Well, it seems like our interview with the AICPA's VP of Taxation got people riled up a bit. I got riled up a bit. I was listening to your interview. I listened to all our episodes and I've never been upset listening to our own podcast. And I got really upset that I had to pause it. I had to stop listening for a bit and then re- resumed. And I thought it was just me. And I was like, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm overreacting. Then we got all these reviews and voicemails and everything else. And it wasn't just me. So you want to recap before you jump into and reading some of these things, like what that episode was, that bonus episode, to episode 222? Yeah. And you know, if you've got an hour to spare, it's worth a listen. I apologize. I'm not the best interviewer yet. So I haven't mastered how to get something like that down into 10 minutes. So it does take a while to get through. You could skip forward to like the, I don't know, the 20 minute mark or something is where we really get going. But uh, it was an interview I did with Ed Carl, who is the AICPA's VP of taxation. Basically, I was curious what the AICPA's position is on the IRS funding levels, because there's been so much in the news about how the IRS doesn't have enough agents to go after high net worth individuals, how as much as half of business income not reported to the federal government may go unreported. So stuff that's not on a W-2 or a 1099, for instance, massive tax evasion that's happening in this country. And we even had a story this week The IRS commissioner, the current IRS commissioner, Chuck Reddick, testified in front of Congress saying that as much as a trillion dollars a year may be going missing, may be not collected, I should say, because of tax evasion. And to summarize your point of view, we kind of talked about it last week before, or maybe even the week before that, like, hey, if you just collect the taxes, you don't even need to raise taxes. Right. And that's why I was thinking about this. Even if you collect a portion of them, I think. and I consider myself to be a moderate. I am I am not in favor of raising taxes just to raise taxes. I believe in a fiscally responsible government. I don't believe in modern monetary theory where we print money forever. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, if the Democrats are in power and they want to spend money, at least let's try not to raise taxes. Let's figure out how to do this with, without uh, raising taxes. And if you just collected the money that is currently not being collected, the, the legitimate tax that is due – that people aren't paying because the IRS is underfunded and nobody's... Which is the fundamental argument, which we, which we yeah. pointed out. The, the, for, for the, last, the entire history of this podcast, we've talked about how the IRS has this problem here because they don't have funding to upgrade the computer. They have this problem here because they don't have funding to have bodies to open physical mail. They, uh, no, they can't answer the phone calls. It's all yeah. funding, the IRS. And I think it creates ethical issues for accountants too, because the less enforcement there is, the more we become the enforcement mechanism. So it's up to us to tell our clients what they can and cannot do. And the clients are saying, push the envelope push for me, push the envelope for me, or just do this blatantly illegal thing. And and we are put in the position of having to decide whether or not we're going to do that, which I think is wrong. And so I want to ask the AICPA through Ed Carl, like, what is the position of the AICPA on all this stuff? And anyway. So I'm going to pause you there. Let's read these reviews. Let's read some of the comments we got about this. Um, Hopefully, because this is how the Cloud Accounting Podcast goes, we show up, we have these stories, we think it's going to go one way, and then all these reviews are going to steer us, obviously. We're going to spend a lot of time yapping about this today, I think. Maybe we'll get to these remote work stories we keep promising. Um, And then there's some app news like that kind of happened. Okay, so this first one is from Nels Larson, CPA. He said, this podcast is a great blend of accounting tech and apps and accounting current events, and somehow Blake and David still squeeze in a little edutainment factor in a nerdy way that any CPA slash accountant would love. Well, that is my objective in life, edutainment, nerdy, fun. Thank you. 
This next one is on Apple Podcasts. It is from The Finance Wizard. I checked out the podcast after hearing it earlier. It's really entertaining show and gives good information and insights. I also appreciate the way you guys include links to the articles you reference. Even your ads are insightful. I'm looking forward to listening more. I you look like a listener uses the show notes. Yes, it takes a lot of work. I'm so glad you're using them. Thank you. <laughs> Here's another one. Five stars. This is Apple Podcast from Scott Scarano. I love that this review doubles donations for Meals on Wheels. You both rock. Sorry so late to the party. Just started listening a few weeks ago. But this is by far the best podcast for someone growth-minded and ready to keep the accounting industry moving forward and evolving. Go back and listen to some of the older episodes and how relevant the topics discussed and proposed solutions are today. Effin fantastic. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, we got two more. Inspiring and motivating even from abroad. Hi, I'm a French CPA and joined the podcast since over a year now. It is such a pleasure to get my weekly dose of accounting and technology input. Even for us non-US CPA, I fully recommend this podcast. Contact me if you want to expand the podcast in Europe. Thank you both. Regards, Loic. Wow, that's so cool. We have international listeners in France. And here's the last one. And this is specifically about the uh, AICPA interview. Favorite episode... 222. I'm one for conspiracies, and I think you found one here. LOL. The AICPA and Congress both are ran by big business, and big business would love nothing more than to see the IRS get lost in the shuffle. The only thing Ed Carl brought to the table was crickets and dancing shoes, and it was hilarious. I was waiting for the courtesy disconnect, but instead he just got down with the boot scootin' boogie. Huge fan of you both. <laughs> love the show. This episode, 222, shows true character of both y'all and the AICPA. Do not stop doing what you are doing. America needs more smart and honest accountants. That's from It's Me Beak via Apple Podcasts. And I think that's all of them. That's all the reviews. Again, thank you for writing reviews. If you go to podchaser.com and you write a review, it'll actually uh, donate to Meals on Wheels. And if you reply to your review, uh, they double the donation. So we love the, the efforts everybody's putting through this month to uh, support Meals on Wheels. And we got a listener email on the AICPA topic. So I'd love to read that for you now, David. This is from a head of FP&A at a leading cloud CPA firm who asked to remain anonymous. I had to stop listening after 45 minutes. I was so pissed. If you are going to do a listener feedback section, you can quote me. No name, please. Don't want the AICPA police coming after me. You can bet that the lead lobbyists for the oil and gas industry have specific funding levels they want their regulatory agencies to have. And for sure, they have very specific numbers of audits they want the feds to do at their facilities. Why wouldn't the AICPA have informed opinions with specific metrics? You know accountants like numbers. Lobbyists aren't supposed to ask Congress and the administration to do their jobs. They are supposed to advance specific proposals that are in the best interest of their members and hopefully the general public. That's similar to what I said last week on the show. I was like, I guarantee the airline industry is worried about the funding levels of the uh, FAA. FAA. And the oil companies are definitely worried about the – have. Uh, opinions on the funding levels and the operations of the EPA, right? Everybody has this. Food and drug, obviously the big pharma has opinions on how the food and drug yeah. is funded. Like this, it's just the, the whole, like the avoidance of like, it's not our, we're, we're not really involved at that level. It seems crazy to me because I, I feel like every other industry is totally involved like that. Yeah. And for the listeners who didn't hear the interview, basically the takeaway is that the AICPA has no position on what IRS funding levels should be. They do think it should be more. I got that out of there, but not how much more they wouldn't say. And then there's there's no actual position on what the service levels should be other than that they should be somehow better. And they're, they're not good now, but like how quickly should the IRS answer the phone? what specific things do we need from them? I didn't hear any of that in the interview and I tried for like an hour to to figure it out. So yeah, it's like, why don't we ask for those things? Why don't we survey our members, survey accountants, people who interact with the IRS and say, hey, what 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 do you think would be appropriate? And then communicate that to Congress. So, the, so one thing they don't want to do is like outsource that to Deloitte because we already know about how Deloitte ran those call centers for the unemployment. <laughs> so, so that's the one thing we know not to do. Don't, don't don't bring in Deloitte to revamp the call center numbers for the IRS. That might be a step backwards. Yeah. We don't want to do that. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Odoo. I was checking out Odoo the other day, and sure, it has all the typical features you would expect in a highly customizable cloud ERP system. 
including dozens of built-in modules and thousands of third-party apps. But one of the built-in app modules really caught my eyes. It's a spreadsheet, but not any spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet that is built directly into the accounting system. By using Odoo's built-in spreadsheet module, you can model and manipulate your data and it instantly stays up to date without any exports or integrations. It's crazy powerful. Imagine a sales rep updating a projected sale amount in a CRM module and having instantly reflected in your spreadsheet. The accounting and invoicing modules are always free, so there's no reason not to give Odoo and the spreadsheet module a try today. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Odoo. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-D-O-O. Unleash your growth potential with Odoo. So David, I think you had a story about the ASCP. I was wondering if we could dig into that now. It's kind of, I, I find it, Hypocritical may not be the right word, but I just find it very entertaining that on one hand, most of the argument of the funding of, in that interview, why they don't focus on the funding is because we're not economists and it takes economists to build expertise. And then we also have to be call center uh, experts. experts and right. and this it's a lot of just avoidance of it, right? Because it's just what they don't care about. But you know what they do care about is CPA licensure. Yes, that is the big thing that AICPA is always advocating for, and they've got a huge initiative on and, this. And, right? and if you think about licensing, right, a lot of economists have opinions that it actually stifles economic growth because it's a barrier to entry, mm-hmm. to competition. They Most economists are against that. So here's something that arguably licensure should have an economist making the arguments for it. But guess who is willing to, on that front, we don't need economists. We're going to make the arguments because we're the AICPA. So this is an article from the Journal of Accountancy that came out this week. Legislative threat to CPA licensure stalls in West Virginia. So West Virginia had a bill, just like a lot of these bills that have been uh, popping up, where you know it's going to make it easier to open businesses, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, this goes back to the easiest argument is the whole hairstylist thing, right? If somebody who's doing hair braids or just washing hair or blow drying hair but they're not actually cutting hair, do they need to get a cosmetology license that you need to cut hair? Right. And and this is part of a, a bigger discussion and trend and argument in this country about how, like you said, uh, licensure puts up barriers to entry and, and overly burdensome licensure can be bad for the economy and bad for consumers and businesses because it makes it too hard to become whatever it is you want to do or do whatever it is you know the license is protecting. And And the great example is like in some states – you have to have a cosmetology license to braid hair. And there have been, you know, people put out of business because they didn't have a cosmetology license and they were braiding hair. Like, how does that protect the public? So so basically, the article you brought up is about how lobbyists stop this law in West Virginia that would diminish occupational licensing requirements. This legislation stalled. We can assume that, you know, AICPA had something to do with lobbying against it and stalling it, right? That's why they're writing about it. And it has grown. Um, in 2020, they were tracking about 60 efforts like this. Now they're monitoring about 179. And they have very strong opinions. Their opinions are so strong on this that they actually, I don't know if you knew this, Blake, the AICPA um, with NASBA, they founded a group called ARPL. And basically this group advocates for rigorous licensing standards. And lobbies across this, across the board. And so what? So the AICPA started this group, and now they've went and brought in the Professional Association of Boards of Engineers, Surveyors, Architects, Landscape Architects, and their whole thing is to educate policymakers on the unintended consequences of this type of legislation. So here's the AICPA over here. They won't take a stand on IRS funding, but over here, they'll lead policymaking for a bunch of industries. You know what's interesting about this to me is that we're really focused I guess ASCP is really focused on protecting the license, which like I get, right? That's one of it. It should be one of its core objectives is to protect the CPA because we all spend all this time to go get it. <laughs> but but then at the same time, you don't really need a CPA to do that much anymore. I mean, other than audit, you, what do you need your CPA license for? That's why a lot of firms are no longer CPA firms, right? So like here we are, we, we've got our professional body protecting very strongly this license that you don't really like doesn't give us a lot of the same benefits right like and, and some like, of this legislation the biggest, too but if the license was actually going to benefit us by keeping out competition then like you should need your CPA to do a lot of stuff 
what if you had to have your CPA to, you know, do bookkeeping and accounting and, and, you know, not just do a sign off and an audit, like that would actually be meaningful. <laughs> I mean, I'm not necessarily, not necessarily good for the economy, I suppose. Like you'd have to ask an economist about that, but like, if you really wanted to protect CPAs, like make it so that you actually need your CPA to do something. Yeah. And then I think like, cause some of this, right? Like I think there's laws in some States where you can't put the word accounting in your business name, if you're not a CPA, correct? Correct. And I think like Texas is one of those kind of states. But and, like, and so, so that's that, what's so that confusing helps. about the whole CPA thing, because like, if you let people call themselves accounting and, and ask consumers, I can choose to go to the guy that's not a CPA and the guy that is. It's the same thing with plumbers. I can hire a plumber that is registered with the board of contractors and he's a licensed contractor in the state of Arizona, or I could choose the plumber that's not. They're both plumbers, right? And that that's the... the it's a, it's a, if it's a licensure, it's a licensure. It, well, I think the, the legal profession has a leg up on us here because it's very clear when you hire a lawyer, they have better passed the bar, right? They have to be licensed. Like they, this is not a question. Everyone knows this. When you hire an accountant, that's not true. Like you're not necessarily hiring a CPA. So there's this like, if the AICPA really wanted to, I guess if, if, if they really wanted to protect the license, then they should try to move toward a situation where to call yourself an accountant, you have to be licensed. That that's that's the way the lawyers have done it, right? That that's true. And then but then again, we talked about this last week. This is why accounting firms make so much more money over law firms. Law firms have stifled competition so much that they can't as a business, like that's the ultimate goal of this is to have all accountants and CPAs make more money, right? Yeah. Like that in the end, that's the goal. And if that's the case, maybe more, less competition uh, is not the right path. So the one thing that really struck I, me- I, so, so here's the thing. I just want to summarize this. So here we have the ICP taking a very strong stand on professional licensure, occupational licensure, which doesn't, honestly, I don't think really helps us that much, but they are not taking a strong stand on the thing that would help us a lot which is actually being able to do our jobs when it comes to working with the IRS. Like that, that would meaningfully improve the lives of most tax accountants. You don't need any sort of license to do tax work. Yeah. I mean, you could be an EA too, but I think, I mean, that's one of the problems with tax right now is that like anybody can be a tax preparer. Well, why not? There's no funding for the IRS. They're not going to audit anything. <laughs> it's completely so, – so, and I have a theory on how to actually get the IRS funded, and, and I'll throw my, my proposal out to fix this whole system in a second. Okay. But the other, one thing in this article that really struck a nerve with me is a, it's a quote from Judy Proctor. She's a CPA, CGMA, and CEO of the West Virginia, West Virginia Society of CPAs. And I'm going to kind of read the paragraph, and then they have her sliced up her quote on this. So, so I'll just read the paragraph. The proposals seen across the country typically mix in a variety of occupations. Although vocational occupations don't have the same robust education, examination experience, and continuing education requirements as CPAs or other learned professionals, here's the quote, these bills would lump us together, said Judy Proctor. I, I really hate this paragraph because like, this is you want CPAs to have a good reputation and a good brand? Don't think you're better than everybody else. <laughs> a guy who put in, the plumber who put in 20 works of plumbing, when he comes to fix the plumbing at your office and he charges you 350 bucks for the hour he spent fixing your plumbing, you're not better than this. This comes off as like accountants are Elitist. better than the rest of society, the be better than other professions. Mm. And that's that, that's not a good way to get business clients. They, they don't think yourself as better than everybody else. They're, everybody's shit's important. We're all important. Yeah. And, well, and the fact that a plumber can charge higher rates than many accountants and CPAs shows yeah, exactly, their value exactly. in the marketplace, right? Exactly. <laughs> hey, uh, I've got a story here about uh, about the tax gap that's related to all this stuff. So but before you I jump just... into that, can I give my solution on how we get the IRS funded? Yeah, yeah. Every member of the AICPA, it's very easy. You just organize and you just say, so when, when they open up tax filings, usually whatever, it's like second week of February, whenever you can start filing for the new year. Mm -hmm. Just everybody go on strike and nobody file any taxes <laughs> until the IRS is funded. Let them call our butt. That's the way you get the attention of Congress when there's a, a filing strike. Of, yeah, yeah, filing strike. <laughs> we're not going to we're not going to file any more taxes for anybody in America until you fund the IRS. Well, I, th that's a interesting idea. We'll let our listeners ponder that one. It would work in the meantime. It would work in the meantime. <laughs> All right, good. I've got some follow up. I think I mentioned. Did I mention this already? That Chuck Reddig. Um, he went in front of 
Congress, and he said that as much as a trillion dollars a year in federal taxes may be going unpaid. You started to mention it. Because, continue. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is why it's so relevant to what we're talking about because I did that interview uh, with AICPA before this hearing happened, and so the stats I had in the in the interview were from the New York Times, which looked at an IRS report in 2019, finding that something like six hundred billion dollars a year is not being collected because of lack of enforcement. And Chuck Reddick said that on Tuesday, that it could be as high as a trillion dollars per year. He said, it would not be outlandish to believe that the actual tap tax gap could approach and possibly exceed $1 trillion per year. Here's more from this Wall Street Journal article. The IRS collected more than $3.5 trillion in taxes in the 2019 fiscal year. Past estimates from the agency have suggested that it could bring an additional 5 to $7 in revenue for each added dollar spent on enforcement, which is exactly what you and I were talking about, David, right? Good ROI. Mr. Reddick said the IRS had seen a sharp drop in the number of workers available to enforce the tax code because of a lack of consistent funding from Congress. We're down 17,000 enforcement personnel over the last decade. That has to have an effect. So that's it from me on the tax gap today. Do you think he uh, listened to your interview before he went and testified to Congress? <laughs> Maybe we've reached a tipping point here yeah, that, that people are getting s sick of this massive tax evasion that's just been happening. And it just, it's ridiculous. You know, people who are honest, who pay the tax they owe and report all the income they have, even though it's a self-reporting regime and you could probably get away with hiding it, they end up subsidizing people who don't and they're put at a competitive disadvantage. Oh, there was a story. Uh, th th this is great. So guess who one of these tax evaders is? Roger Stone. The Justice Department has sued Trump ally Roger Stone, alleging millions in unpaid taxes, $2 million in unpaid federal income taxes and fees. Apparently, he had an LLC and he funneled a lot of money through this LLC and didn't declare the income. Like, this is exactly the kind of situation that is, the, this is a specific example of the larger problem because th there's nobody reporting this income like on a W 2. So, you, if you just don't report it, the IRS will never know until they audit you. And the odds of that happening are so slim to none, nobody fears the IRS. Right. right. No you, can, you can get away with it for a really long time, right? And then what is the penalty if you do get caught, right? A lot of times it's like, you know, a few years in jail and then you come out and somehow you have the money, right? You've buried it somewhere or something. It's like, <laughs> it's just too easy. And as long as you're not doing like two illegal things, the odds of you getting caught are very low, right? It's that exactly. whole, like, if your taillights out, don't also speed. Right, you, you you just do one illegal thing, and it's really hard to get caught at the one thing you're doing. So if you're not filing taxes, don't do anything else illegal to draw attention to yourself. Outside of that, uh, should we jump into remote work? Do you want to touch on that from before? Do you want to jump into there's tons of app news? So David, we've got a voicemail that we forgot oh, to get okay. to last week, Perfect. and I want to make sure that we get this. So this is from Ian Crook. Hi, David and Blake. This is Ian Crook from Greenville, South Carolina. On your show today, you were talking about clients or firms wanting to charge their clients every month via ACH. One software that I have used in the past that's great for that is a software called Moon Clerk. And it uses, it's built on top of Stripe and uses their ability to bill customers via ACH. And you pay their monthly fee, and then you just pay the 25 cent, I think it is, per transaction, which is much, much less than the, you know, the Stripe fee of 2.9 or 2.7% plus 30 cents. So uh, it works really great. And uh, if you're wanting just that ACH um, and for the recurring payments, it's a great tool. And did he say boom? Zoom, Noom, I can totally catch that. Moon, M, like the opposite of the sun. Gotcha. Moon clerk. And it's one word. You can go to stripe.com slash partners slash moon clerk and check it out. So it's like an add-on for Stripe, basically, that lets you do one-time and recurring payments without any programming. That's really neat. So thank you for that, Ian. That's a great recommendation. And that was a follow-up to our discussion about the... QuickBooks ACH fees, so it's no longer free for uh, pro advisors. Well, I don't think it was necessarily f ever just only free for accounts. It was always just like the 
the 50 cents or a quarter, whatever the fee was, very, very low for for all users across QuickBooks. And then they've shifted it for everybody, not just, but accountants obviously were utilized, taking advantage of it for their own practices as well. And so it's funny because I don't, a lot of the discussions about that, just to, to sidetrack on that, a lot of the discussions are not on my, about how do I help my clients do their ACH for cheaper or free? Like All the discussions <laughs> about their own practices. How do I bill my clients and avoid the fee? I, it's really funny watching the, the threads. Um, I have a story that about ACH funny. if you want to chat about that. Yeah, let's let's hear it. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Rewind. QuickBooks Online creates a backup of their platform, but not your client's files, leaving you exposed to failed imports, bad app integrations, or manual data entry errors that can corrupt your client's files, creating you hours of work to manually restore it all, pretty much erasing those great profit margins you have because of using the cloud. Rewind automatically creates a backup of your QuickBooks Online files, and a couple of clicks can restore your client's file to the way it was prior to any mishaps. As the leading cloud backup app trusted by over 80,000 organizations across the globe, Rewind has saved thousands of accounting professionals from mind-numbing manual data entry rework. By using Rewind, you can take a proactive approach to your client's data and be the trusted advisor that differentiates you from your competitors by showing your client how Rewind safeguards one of your client's most important assets, their data. Learn even more about Rewind and their new partner referral program that offers cash incentives to accountants and bookkeepers that refer new business, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash rewind. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-E-W-I-N-D. Rewind, protect your data, protect your business. So the ACH network has had set records for monthly payments and the quarter. ACH network did 2.7 billion payments a month for this last quarter. They saw their quarterly volume rise over the first quarter of 2020. So it rose 11.2% year over year. And the payments um, valued 17.3 trillion, almost 19% higher than last year. 19% over last year. Wow. Big increase. Yeah. And the uh, March volume. So for first February had daily averages. In February, it was set records of 118 million payments per day, the highest daily average for a month ever. Then in March, the volume reached 2.7 billion payments for the entire month, which is the largest in the network's history. But they say a lot of this is due to the 110 million direct deposit stimulus payments. So that that really pushed things mm, over yeah, the yeah. edge. And then the other big increase to continue to see, and this is true, like I see it at Melio, like this shift from paper checks to ACH, right? So for American businesses, ACH payments have risen 17.3% to 1.2 billion and the transactions going through. Well, and well, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and then the other one is same day ACH pay, payments passed 1 billion milestone, transferring more than a trillion in value. This may not be a one-time thing. I, I know stimulus payments pushed up the ACH numbers, but that that will probably stay because the IRS has a new program they're launching starting July 1st, the expanded child tax credit is going to launch. And the IRS has a big job to do under that program because now those payments will go out monthly to eligible families. So the IRS, think about this, they're going to have to print millions of checks every single month. The credit is now going to go out monthly. So it could be like $300 a month and it's going to go out until the end of the year. But clearly this is something that the Democrats are hoping to make a permanent thing. So basically turning the IRS into a way to distribute what looks to me like the beginning of a universal basic income for families. And like that's significant. And it's crazy to think that they're asking the IRS to do this when we've just been talking about how they're <laughs> underfunded. <laughs> so Reddig is, you know, he was getting asked questions by the senators on this um, when he was in con- when he was in front of Congress last week. And, you know, they're asking how much is this going to cost? How are you going to do this? Reddick said, we have to create an entire new structure for the Internal Revenue Service. We are not historically a benefits delivery federal agency, but we're setting that up. The cost for that program is $391 million. Right now it will be, and this is my educated guest, a minimum of 300 to 500 people, which includes folks that have to handle the phone service because we'll have to increase phone service. The taxpayer advocate service will get additional touch points. So, I mean, what shouldn't the ICPA argue that this should not be the role of the IRS, that the IRS should not be a benefits agency? Yeah, yeah. 
But <laughs> right. Yeah, that would be a great argument. I think that would be I great. mean, while they're at it, why separate... doesn't the IRS just manage the SBA loan process too? Yeah, right. Let them do everything. They have, they have all this bandwidth. Apparently, an extra budget are going around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, the Biden administration budget includes, I think it's an additional billion dollars for the IRS or, or more than that. So it's about a 10% bump in their budget. But still, as we have discussed, that's like not nearly enough to collect all the money that is out there. I did a rough calculation. I wanted to compare the IRS budget to how much money they collect. How much money does the IRS get every year to collect all the tax? And you could come up with a ratio and see like, is that a reasonable amount of money based on what it costs most businesses to collect? And so the IRS gets like $12 billion a year and they collected more than $3.5 trillion in taxes in the 2019 fiscal year. So if I'm doing this right, that means that the IRS budget is 0.3%, 0.34% of the tax collected. Not that much, right? Like it seems like it could be more. Maybe, maybe it could go this path. You only have to file a tax return if you're over $100,000. You know, that's interesting because when the federal income tax came into existence in 1913, it only applied to the wealthy. In 1913, the top tax bracket was 7% on all income over $500,000, which is $11 million in today's dollars. And the lowest tax bracket was 1%. And the vast majority of people in this country didn't file a tax return. It was just the wealthy. I can't believe you just had the stat on that. Like you're ready to go with an article like that. This is this is I'm good. We're I'm... professionals here. Like I had no clue I would toss you that and you just happen to have the stats right there the way it used to be. David, I'm a CPA. My entire job is just Googling stuff that I don't know. I have one more listener mail. Okay. This came in through LinkedIn. This is from Amir. He said, Hey Blake, big fan of the podcast. You mentioned in the recent episode that your pricing formula incorporated monthly expense amounts instead of the number of transactions. All else equal, would a client who had more monthly transactions not create a larger workload for your bookkeepers? If you could elaborate a bit more on choosing expense as the metric, I'd be grateful for your insight. Now, this is a question about the value pricing discussion that we had a couple episodes ago where I, I shared how I did the fixed slash value pricing for my firm. It was, a, it was a fixed pricing that incorporated elements of value pricing. Let's just say that. And, and so I kept it really, really simple. And when it came to bookkeeping, I didn't look at the number of transactions that they had. I based the price primarily on how much were they spending every month? And so I had different buckets. So if you were, as a business, if you spent $100,000 a month, you would fall into one tier. And if it was $10,000 a month, you'd fall into one tier. I didn't look at like if you had 100 transactions or 1,000 transactions. Yeah, because you're leaving money on the table. If I, had, if, if I was going to be your client, Blake, and I have two expenses a month and they add up to $50,000, but you priced me on the number of the number of transactions, you're leaving money on the table versus somebody else who has, you know, hundreds of transactions a month that add up to $100,000. You'd be leaving money on the table. But the other way, you do, like his point is you run the risk of having a higher expense. Yeah, my cost of labor could be yeah. like in, too much. But that's the whole beauty of like fixed fee billing and value billing like this. Now you're motivated to figure out how to make your staff and your processes more efficient to handle that transaction volume. And when it comes to high transaction volume businesses, I figured out that with cloud-based accounting systems and bank rules... I could automate the coding of 80 to 90% of transactions. So to really lay this out for people, let's say you had two clients. You had one with 100 transactions and another with 200 transactions, and they both had around the same monthly expenditures. So I'm going to charge them the same amount of money. You might say, well, one has twice as many transactions. Isn't that going to take you twice as much work? And that is the natural response when you're used to doing manual data entry. It would take twice as much work if you had to key in every transaction. But if you use bank rules and automation to get the transactions into the system automatically, you're coding 90% of them. Well, let's say it's 90%. Multiply 100 transactions by 0.1 because you only have 10% of them left to code and that's 10. And that 200 transactions becomes 20 to code. Now, what's the difference between coding 10 transactions and 20 transactions? The time is immaterial. It's not really going to take you that much time to do it. So that's why I didn't consider the transaction volume. 
And now, and now I think even more, if you start, if you're in a niche, it's even more efficient because I think QuickBooks Online, and I don't know if Zero lets you do this, but you can take your bank rules from one client and move them to another client. So those efficiencies just keep multiplying on top of themselves. Yeah. And especially if you're in the same, if you have a dentist and they're buying from the same suppliers, all the rules you made for those suppliers on the first dentist, you just import those to the dentist too. And you've already, you're, you're ahead in the game. And to take this to the value pricing conversation, you got to remember that the reason the client is paying you let me say it this way. What creates value for the client is not you coding those transactions. There's zero value <laughs> to the client for just coding transactions. And even the P&L that you produce has very little value to them. What they really value is the ability to call you up and ask you questions. Do I need to go get this local business license? Like, how do I do that? Can you do it for me? Should I do it? Do I need to do 1099s for these people? You know, all sorts of tons of questions that you get as a bookkeeper and accountant. And that's your advantage against automated services like QuickBooks Live, or they, they just don't have the ability to do that research and answer those questions because they're trying to automate everything. So, so we have the advantage. We can automate what we want to automate, and then we can have that personalized service for the stuff that needs it. When you're not on hold with the IRS. So there was a follow-up that Amir asked me that I thought was interesting too. He said, thanks for this. You mentioned a challenge for many cloud accounting firms is managing the relationship and if a bookkeeper leaves, the client may churn as well. That's usually the biggest reason that clients churn, in my opinion. Could this be mitigated in larger firms by setting up teams to help clients in a particular industry rather than one bookkeeper dealing with a client? This way, if a bookkeeper leaves, the team will have enough industry knowledge to maintain continuity. And that is brilliant. And that was exactly a project that I was working on before I got into the software side of things is I had this idea. Um, uh, I, I had a proposal out to create pods in my firm. And the way it would work is you'd have three to five staff, three is probably enough, who would work together on a pool of clients and share those clients. And that way, if one was on vacation, the other two could keep going. And you'd always have enough capacity in that pod so that they could take vacations. And you leave it up to them to manage those clients. And then you incentivize them based on their total billings. So you could have like a, a profit share kind of situation going on where if one pod can have you know, 40 clients and the other pod has 20 clients, you reward the pod with 40 clients and you incentivize them to compete with each other on revenue and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I didn't do it, so I don't know if it actually works, but I think it's a good idea. You want to jump into remote work then knock out with some app news at the end? So what, what remote work stories recently are, are surprising you? I, I saw these stories out of the UK that were interesting and I wonder... Like, is this just a UK thing or is this going to happen in the US? I, I have the two stories I have that I brought, then I've had them now for two weeks, are kind of the pendulum away from remote work. Oh, really? Okay. So I don't know if you have, if you have a, what, if, I don't know if your stuff's like pro remote work, here's the surveys, here's this, here's this, or what you usually have. And then we can talk about this human part of it and the toll of remote work. So let's talk about what's happening in the UK in the big four. PWC. In the, in the UK, has told its staff there that they can spend around half their working hours at home after the COVID-19 pandemic ends and clock off early on Fridays during the summer. That's according to a Market Watch story. They have 22,000 employees in the UK, by the way. And so spending 40 to 60% of their time at home versus in the office, I mean, that's a big shift. And also Grant Thornton in the UK is making a change. They've got 4,500 employees and they expect that their employees are going to spend the majority of their time working from home post-pandemic. And that's according to an in-house employee survey. Like the employees themselves want to keep working from home. 88% of them want to keep working from home a majority of the time. This was in the, in, in the UK? In the UK, yeah. UK. Okay. And that was according to an in-house Grant Thornton survey in the UK. Now, <laughs> I'm curious how that compares to the data you're seeing. The two articles I really saw, one was a, a guest blogger on the AICP, AICPA.org's blog. This is an article from Eugene Park, CPA audit partner of Heinfeld Meech and Company. He wrote an article, and the title of the article is CPAs are Human Too, Workplace Relationships Matter. And he goes on to talk about how his, in his career, his most memorable moments are not the audit tasks he's, he's done, but it was the teens he was on and what they learned about each other. And he goes on to talk about in the article, right? When you're working face-to-face -face and you're hanging around with people and you have these great work relationships, you have people you can vent with, laugh with, 
you can rely on during stressful times. And this will go into this other article about those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a personal emergency, they can help you out. They can pick up some of your workload, right? And ultimately, they can depend on you and vice versa, right? You have a true relationship, right? Versus like these arbitrary, like he, he calls them arbitrary LinkedIn connections. Mm. Um, and then, you know, he talks about, you know, how to build relationships over time, you know, ask the person about their story, listen with intent, you know, embrace awkward, right? And don't let it ruin your touch points in the future and just extending help. Like it's very personal type stuff. That's a little bit hard, arguably to do in the remote world. And uh, I, did, I, I like, just want to say, I, I yeah. think it's interesting that it's a partner who is making this argument, right? Of course they, they want their staff back in that audit room, you okay, know, so they okay. can see I, them I working. I could see that, but he, uh, he goes on and he summarizes it with, you know, in an industry where we choose to serve the public, we accountants or CPAs are often mistaken as hermits are not social. The last time I checked CPAs are humans too. So I just, huh. it resonated with me in this, in this world of, of remote work that we're in. So I have another article and this article was in the Atlantic during the pandemic, right? For American workers, about one third to one half of us actually had to work in person. But that means the other half of us were, or almost two thirds, right? Were stuck at home, mm -hmm. right? And so they, they, there are some polls that are out there and this goes against the poll. You just talked about the U UK, but that people feel like the cons from working from home outweigh the pros. And a third of the people surveyed said they considered quitting their jobs since they got banned from the workplace. And that Where was the survey home. done? This, um, this is an American, American employees. Okay. Uh, it doesn't actually say what the survey was. I mean, I could see like a third of employees wanting to quit because now they don't have to go to that office anymore. They could work for any virtual company, any remote company. That's true. There's some you know, upside benefit there. Yeah. There's probably a big economic benefit to like not having location be the primary uh, decision of where you work. And another poll, about 70% said mixing work and other responsibilities at home is a source of stress. And three and four Americans have admitted that they've been, they're burnt out. They've, yeah, the pandemic is they've confessed they've been burnt out. Um, and then and article, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Like the number one problem of working from home is not knowing when to quit. Yeah. And this article goes uh, really to the article we just talked about, right, about CPAs being humans. So this article goes really the, the misery of the loneliness, right, that can lead to depression and substance mm. abuse and sedentary behavior and relationship damage, right? Ultimately, they, they, what they suspect long term to summarize kind of this article that the productivity hit of loneliness and all the other bad things about working remotely is going to eventually catch up to the, per, the the short term gain everybody got right away from the you know the whole oh everybody's working all the time and everybody right, right. saw a productivity boost um, and then the last thing I'll just close out this with is a. Uh, 70% of employees said their friendships at, at their job are the most important element of a happy work life. And it's hard to have those friendships remotely. There's no doubt. It, it, you can still have them, but it's not the same. No, it definitely isn't. It's not the same as going to a happy hour with your coworkers at the end of a long day, right? Or a tough client meeting or something. Yes. I, so 100%. So, so we need human contact ultimately is a summary of these two articles. And because it's funny, because I think even... Um, Salesforce declared a hey, people are going to work from home. But then I think other companies like Amazon said they're bringing people back to the office or, or maybe it was Microsoft. It was one of the Seattle companies, right? Yeah. So there's, there's uh, an open argument here. And it's just funny that you said a partner is making the argument that people should go to the office. <laughs> That's always how it is, right? This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Client Hub. Are your clients creating bottlenecks in your workflow? Typical workflow systems are built for internal teams only and not clients, leaving your team constantly waiting for client responses. Client Hub is the one and only workflow solution with a client collaboration portal that automates client requests for everything you need to complete your work. Client Hub is built by cloud accountants for cloud accountants, and when you adopt Client Hub's unique combination of workflow and client collaboration, magic happens. They guarantee it. Your team will love powerful checklist workflows. Your clients will love the easy to use Client Hub web portal and mobile app. Client Hub currently has an amazing offer just for our listeners. 25% off your first three months by using promo code CAP25. And at the end of three months, if Client Hub hasn't radically improved your productivity, they will refund your money. It's a zero risk way to remove all your blocked client workflows. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash client hub. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C L I E N T H U B.
One more story here about remote work, or, or I guess this is more of like a pandemic induced problem here uh, that's related. PwC has been having trouble along with a lot of large employers getting employees to take vacation during the pandemic. And so if they accrue vacation time, those balances, those liabilities are huge. And the big companies are starting to worry about this. Like, how do I get my employees to take vacation? And PwC had a solution. They decided that they are going to be offering their U.S. staffers $250 for every full week of vacation booked, up to $1,000 a year. This article in the Wall Street Journal says, quote, the plan could cost the firm millions, but the company has exhausted other attempts to get employees to disconnect, says Tim Ryan, PwC U.S. chairman. We want to show these people we're serious, Mr. Ryan says. Economic incentives do have a way of helping. So they're trying to use a carrot to get this behavior change. Right. So I don't know if you uh, – it feels like it was a long time ago. You might have still been like in college. I don't even know when. But this is a big trick all the tech companies were doing in California, and California banned it. What's happening is if tech companies wanted to hit their numbers right at the end of a quarter – or the end of the year, they would force all the employees, like they do a company shutdown. Everybody has to take a vacation this week. Mm -hmm. And they would move that money from the balance sheet. It would lower your expenses because you basically cut an entire payroll out. And now you hit the numbers for the street. And they, the state of California basically, because all, all the tech companies, it's typical, every tech company just copies the other tech companies in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And two, it was on the train. They all were on this treadmill and they did it about two, three years in a row. And then, you know, it's all came to stop. It's basically, I think in the state of California, they, they ruled as being illegal. Okay. And they're not allowed to do that anymore. You can't force your employees to take a vacation like that. So, so obviously now they're trying to motivate them with the spiff. I would in what firm was this? Uh, th this was PwC. All right. So that's going to incentivize. I, I would tell everybody at PwC, hold out. Have them give you two thousand dollars for a vacation or plane tickets or something. <laughs> I think the real problem is going to be like the next um, busy season, right? Everyone, if everyone tries to take all their vacation at the end of the year, it's going to be a problem. They won't have enough staffing. Like that, th this is what the pandemic has done, right? Everyone now has all this built up vacation, and they got to get people to use it. And they can't force you to use it. They can't. So it doesn't. Like, like you, you have all the power here as an employee. So in the time we got left, let's hit some app news. NetSuite had a release focused on, it looks like a lot of purchasing and spend. So you, this might be interesting to you, David. The big thing with purchasing is uh, NetSuite, Oracle NetSuite's ERP now centralizes purchasing across all of your organizations. So if you have multiple entities, multiple, multiple subsidiaries, you can now manage the purchasing and approvals across all those in one place and pay vendors from a single location. So that's really powerful. And then this part uh, is gonna help the users a lot. Email approval. So organizations can now simply click an email link to review, approve, or reject transactions. And I saw a screenshot of this. So the way it works is you as the approver get an email and then it says, here's the, here's the bill, uh, here's the amount, approve or reject. So instead of me having to click a button that takes me to a website, then I have to do approve or reject. I do it right. Just like in my email, if I get the, do you want to go to this appointment? Yes or no. And I hit accept and I, I accept the calendar appointment. So kind of that same concept, but as the approver of transactions. Yeah. And I love that because getting people to actually remember their login and to log in, especially when all they do is approve stuff is so hard. <laughs> They're always forgetting it, right? And they don't want to do it. So they don't, they don't do it on their phone. This way they can just do it. This seems like a good practice. Everybody should implement all apps. Yeah, of course, the, the risk then is that you have people who just click approve on everything, right? Because they're not actually looking at the transaction. Which is usually the case. It's usually anyways. the case anyway. So. so so exactly. like So just cut the, the extra clicking out. <laughs> if they're just going to hit approve anyways, just give them the button and the email. That makes sense. Uh, all right. What do you got? I have some from NetSuite as well. So NetSuite, um, they've officially uh, rolled out their suite accountants. It's, so it's suite, like NetSuite, S-U-I-T-E, accountants. I thought it's a, it's a, it's actually a smart branding for your accountants program. I like it's it. Suite accountants. It's a, you could play with that a lot. Um, and it's a free program uh, helping accountants uh, serve their fast-growing organizations. And they basically, it's going to um, offer free access to NetSuite licensing, training courses, et cetera. So I think for some people that either resell or implement NetSuite, if you're not in the accounts program, I think there's fees in different programs. Like, let's say you're a, uh, a value-added reseller or something. So there, there, there's some sort of special licensing set up for accountants. Yes, significant, significant discounts. Um, so you, like 
and, and actually, I, I know firms that have made this a big part of their their value prop to clients is sign up with us. You're a startup, for instance, and you want to get NetSuite. We can get it for you and bundle it as part of our service fee. And so the 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 alternative is like go buy NetSuite and get my own in-house accountants, or just go with this outsource provider who is going to give me NetSuite for like and service for the same price. Well, you know who's uh, not using NetSuite anymore? Who's that? Google. Google is going to move from NetSuite to SAP. Wait, wait, wait. Google? Like Alphabet was yes. on NetSuite? NetSuite. And now they're going to move to SAP. Coincidentally, this is the same day as the Supreme Court gave a final verdict on a decade-long battle between Oracle and Google about Java APIs. Wait, are you sure that Google wasn't on Oracle, not NetSuite? Like, I just have a hard time imagining a company as large as Google being on NetSuite. Oh, sorry. My bad. Yes. <laughs> I, I guess in my brain, I put together Oracle, NetSuite, and Oracle. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're just on Oracle. Google's going from Oracle ERP to SAP. SAP. They're moving to SAP. And it's funny because if I, there was a time Oracle was on QuickBooks Desktop. Like I, this, I think they were um, almost a half a billion dollars in revenue before they finally got off QuickBooks Desktop. So it's always funny when people talk about like yeah. how big of a company can be on this or this. And I think uh, QuickBooks Online, I think Uber was on QuickBooks Online. So they got to like 70,000 drivers. Like so, so companies can get very big with these, with our smaller cloud accounting or even desktop accounting packages. But it's interesting to watch how Google moved basically from QuickBooks desktop to Oracle and now SAP. Accounting firm Grant Thornton has created a proprietary app for automated controls testing targeted at auditors. It's called CTA.X. It's designed to help audit firms develop and deploy automated internal controls tests to comply with regulations, including from Sarbanes Oxley. Uh, I don't know if there's anything more interesting to say about that. All right. So I have uh, another account, accounting firm story, an accounting firm that uh, launched a niche app. Okay. So there's a, a new website and a new app called truckersbooksonline.com. Truckers Books Online. Truckers Books Online. And what's interesting about this, it's basically, it's an outsourced accounting firm. Mm. But they set up their own, their own app, its own marketing, its own website. And, you know, it's geared. Truckers simply use their phone or tablet to snap a picture, scan copies of their bookkeeping the receipts, et cetera. And then they can get their taxes and monthly reporting done, et cetera. So they're using a whole domain and a whole app really is their funnel to bring in new business ultimately. And this firm is B BPM source is the company. It's really brilliant because people are getting conditioned to purchase things this way. Like they're conditioned to like find a, an app that solves a problem that they have. So if you make the app, the front of your firm, then people will just find that app and then they'll sign up for your services as part of it. I've always, so the number one search box is Google. The number two is YouTube. I've always thought, even though Apple's never said it, I, I suspect the number three search box on the internet is the app store. It certainly could be. Here is a story about one of our favorite apps, Robinhood, and the tax pitfalls of being a Robinhood investor. So one of the issues about Robinhood that I did not know, aside from them, you know, just like not working a lot of the time, is that you cannot designate inside of their app the lot of stock you want to sell. Meaning when you buy stock, you buy X number of shares at a particular price. And then later you buy X number of shares at a different price. And you buy X shares at a different price. When you go to sell, let's say you've accumulated, I don't know, a thousand shares at different prices, different costs. When you go to sell on Robinhood, it doesn't let you pick which lot of ta of, of stock you want to sell. Which affects my gains because maybe I bought some stock at $10 a share and other stock at $30 a share and I'm selling it all at 50. It affects... So then how do they calculate this? There are different ways that these apps, Robinhood, Webull, SoFi, Uphold, and Public.com calculate it. Robinhood says that it uses FIFO, so first in, first out. So the oldest shares are sold first. Generally, that's good and could lower your tax rates if the older shares have been held longer than a year, but it might not. But nothing about nothing about Robinhood is set up to invest in the long term, right? Robinhood's big game is it's very it's like a game, right? It's very yeah. addictive. Trade again, trade again. We're going to give you an emoji and a firework because you traded. Trade again, trade again. <laughs> and so this is going to people are going to be surprised. When they get yeah. to do their taxes this year. Well, and so that's what's happened is, you know, they found a Robinhood trader who has like 
like two hundred thousand dollars in his Robinhood account, which just like scares the shit out of me. Like, <laughs> go get a go get a real brokerage account, especially that company. Oh god. Yeah. Um, so anyway, apparently a lot of like financial advisors are getting clients who are in the upper end of Robinhood's, you know, like user base because they can't do this kind of thing, and the other platforms let you do that, and you can like figure out wash sales and. Uh, and if you do this right, it actually has a, a, a benefit. You can boost your after-tax returns by an average of 0.82% if you're in the 35% tax bracket by using strategies to sell the proper lots and minimize your taxes. So it's just something to be aware of, I think, when, when clients ask you about Robinhood, and they probably are and will, like this is something that you can bring up as a tax pro, like, hey, by the way, you can't designate lots, so the tax treatment is not going to be as good. And you're going to, you're going to spend more money. You're going to pay more in capital gains tax. Um, thought that was interesting. And that's all I've got for app news. I think we're coming up at the end of our show. David, if users want to get in touch with you, where can they do that? I'm on all the socials as David Leary. Very easy to find. And I am at Blake T. Oliver. Please leave us a review. We really appreciate those. We will read it on the air. And you're also welcome to leave us a voicemail, just like Ian did. Our voicemail number is 202-695-1040, 202-695-1040. Hey, if you're on the road listening to us, dial in, give us a call, go straight to voicemail. We will take a listen. Actually, I have something I'd like people to maybe leave their opinions on. Okay. Uh, so I watched the HBO miniseries um, Chernobyl. Right, recently. That's a good week. one. It's That's really a good. good. One. Yeah. And I recently watched, and a couple months ago, I watched the, there was a, a documentary about the Challenger disaster. So, but these took place, what, circa 86, right, 1986. And I, I just feel like there's a lot of parallels to both those those stories. This this exuberance, like, we're so great. Like, they forced the launch of the shuttle prematurely. Everybody thought their shit didn't stink, and it caused a major disaster. And then the same thing, Chernobyl, in a way, right? They kept secrets, like, oh, we're so great. And they're, they're out there, they're solving this problem on their own. They refused help from other countries. Like, but the main root cause, both of them, the root causes are very kind of similar. And it makes me think about our own industry. Like, is there something in the accounting industry that we're all lying to ourselves about? And it's going to bite us one day in a very, very catastrophic way. I just, I would wonder if anybody's had thoughts or think about it that way. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I'll have to think about it. Do let us know. Again, that number is 202 695 1040 202-695-1040. David, until next week, um, good luck on your construction project. Hope that is going well. One of these days. <laughs> One of these days it'll be done and we'll we'll put those pictures on our Instagram account. I, 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 maybe listeners can help us. Can I claim the whole thing as a so – I'm going to put the recording studio and an office in there. Can I – I'm actually afraid to even try to claim that because I think that's a trigger to actually get audited by the IRS. Oh, the home office home deduction? Home office deduction. Yeah, it definitely is. But I mean if you can substantiate it, do it, you know? Take advantage of all the deductions you are entitled to. That's my philosophy. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Time for the classifieds. BKX is the community event only for bookkeeping professionals. The BKX conference hosted by the Digital Bookkeeper Association is June 22nd through the 24th in Las Vegas. This year will include keynote speaker Aaron Brockovich. Both in-person and virtual tickets are available. And as a Cloud Accounting Podcast listener, you can receive 15% off when you apply the promo code CLOUD15 at checkout. All lowercase letters, that's CLOUD15. Visit bkx.com to learn more and register. Are you an accountant or bookkeeper who wants to get the most out of Zero? Zero, a comprehensive guide for accountants and bookkeepers is available now. Author Amanda Aguilar shares eight years of experience using Zero in her own practice to connect the dots between accounting theory and software. See why Zero founder Rod Drury calls her a proven expert in getting the most out of the Zero platform and ecosystem. Buy it now on Amazon or through your local bookseller. With new tech coming out from around the world each day, how do you filter out the noise and find the best tech for your firm? Launch for Accountants is a tech discovery platform made for accounting firm owners. Here are just a few of the most popular launches from the month of January. A web-based tool for building narratives around your 10 key tapes, a PPP forgiveness utility, and a financial modeling platform that integrates with your entire cloud stack. To learn more, sign up for the weekly newsletter at launchfa.com. 
Have you ever joined a mastermind group with other accounting professionals? The Realize Accountant Community is organizing mastermind groups for accountants, with groups kicking off this May. Whether you're a firm owner, a staff accountant, at a small firm, or a big four, Realize is matchmaking pros offering similar services and like-sized firms. You'll spend six months in a group of five going deep on issue specifics to you and your firm. Signups close April 30th. Learn more at rlz.io. That's rlz.io. I quickly wanted to let you know about a new project that I've been working on for the last year or so. I'm launching a podcast network called Accounting Podcast Network. It has new podcasts that I know you'll love, like the Accounting Salon Conversations podcast hosted by Amanda Aguilar and the Accounting Automation Workflows podcast co-hosted by Brian Clare and Heather Satterley. Head over to accountingpodcastnetwork.com. That's accountingpodcastnetwork.com. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.